Good morning, church family. Uh, my name is Mike Kopek, if you've never met me, and I'll be reading some supporting scripture uh, prior to Ozon. So I'm reading out of the ESV, and this is John uh, chapter 7, verses 25 through 52. So some of the people in Jerusalem therefore said, is this not the man that they seek to kill? And here he is, speaking openly, and they say nothing to him. Where this, can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Christ? But we know where this man comes from, and when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. So Jesus proclaimed, as he taught in the temple, you know me, and you know where I come from, but I have not come on my own accord. He who sent me is true, and him you do not know. I know him, for I come from him, and he sent me. So they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not come. Yet many of the people believed in him. They said, when the Christ appears, he will do many good signs. Will he do more good signs than this man has done? The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him. And the chief priests and Pharisees sent the officers to arrest him. Jesus then said, I will be with you a little longer, and then I am going to him who sent me. You will seek me, and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? What does he mean by saying, You will seek me, and you will not find me? Where I am, you cannot come. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, the scripture has said, Out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet, the Spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. When they heard these words, some of the people said, this is really the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So there was a division among the people over him some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers then came to the chief priests and the Pharisees who said to them, why did you not bring him? The officers answered, no one ever spoke like this man. The Pharisees answered them, have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities of the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, who had gone to him before and who was one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man first, without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. Would you bar your hearts with me in prayer? Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you and give you all the praise and glory. Lord, we humbly seek your guidance and your wisdom as we share these verses in John. And we lift up Ozan. Lord, give him blessings of strength, wisdom, and discernment as he unpacks what is going on in the time of these dialogues, and these debates surrounding your son, Jesus Christ. Help us understand the deeper meaning of your word, that it will renew our minds and produce abundantly in our lives. Lord, strengthen our faith and bring us ever closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 
Good morning, church family. My name is Ozan Farron. For those of you who don't know me, um, there are many who do know me, but for those of you who don't know me, when I first became a Christian, baby Christian for the first time, this is the church that I landed in. And many of those years was under the tutelage of my brother PJ, whom I really get to enjoy that same sort of fellowship and brotherhood with. And so I'm very thankful for the invitation. Just a little bit of a, a context for my coming here this morning. I told myself, if someone doesn't come and pray for me, I'm going to search somebody out to pray for me. Prayer is a very important aspect of my Christian life. And as it turns out, about five people came up to me and prayed for me this morning. I feel like I'm washed <laughs> by prayer. And so I'm just so thankful for that. And my brother Mike is one of those individuals. If, not, not to put you on the spot, Mike, but if you need prayer, go to this brother. He will pray for you. He's not one of those individuals who said, I'm praying for you, and then goes on with life. He's one of those individuals who will write this thing down and he will devote himself to prayer, and I am very, very thankful for that. Um, one of the things we heard already in our song this morning is that we want to know Jesus and we want to know him more. And so I want to start just by getting the ground system in place, right? Why is it that John wrote the book? Why is it that, what, what was the purpose of John's writing this gospel account from his perspective. Well, this is no secret. He takes the guesswork completely out of it, and he tells us in John chapter 20. John chapter 20, I'm just going to turn there for just a brief moment. In verse 30 and 31, he says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, listen to this, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have eternal life in his name. This is the purpose for which John wrote this book, that you may know Christ, that you may get to know him more, and without a shadow of a doubt, know that he is the Christ. He is one with God, the Son of God, and that in believing, you would receive eternal life. What more can we say? So he doesn't look to try and get all the details hashed out, but he wants to provide us with enough information to know that Jesus is the Christ, he is the Son of the living God, and that by believing in him, you will have eternal life. Amen? Amen. Now, last week, Brian Gibson brought the word, that, and he informed us that when we are to judge the witness of Christ, we are to judge him with right judgment, not with the sort of appearance that many people have, but with righteous and sound judgment that we are to look for the reality and the substance of who Jesus is. And so there's this evangelistic undertone that's taking place with John to know God, to know him more, to receive the eternal gift of life. And we're only seven chapters in, and this has become crystal clear to us, I hope, by now. From Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jew, to the unnamed Samaritan woman at the well, to the large crowds that we've read about, right, the feeding of the 5,000s, to some of the smaller crowds like the disciples following the, that, that horrific event from their perspective of the boat and the storm. And in the series of events that unfold, we see that there is this deliberate timing with Jesus. He, he's deliberate in his timing. He's deliberate in his message, and he's deliberate in his mission. And so now we arrive at another grand invitation from the mouth of our Lord Jesus Christ, only this time Jesus is coming and invites an entire congregation of people. And so I hope that there's a lot of relevance to us this morning because he's not just going to any people. He's going to people that are at the temple. He's going to the congregation. He's going to God's people. And now it is late September. It's early October during this special festival for the Jews. And I'm going to cast you into the history of the Jews. and Because if we don't understand what's happening in this context, it's going to be very difficult to understand the central piece of what John is communicating through the mouth of Jesus. I'm going to cast you into the Feast of Tabernacles. This is also known as the Feast of Tents. It's known as the Feast of Booths, as some people put it. And this feast was instituted by God. It's recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 16 and verse 16. I'm not going to go into that detail for the sake of time, but that's where it's recorded. And it is unquestionably one of the most festive weeks of the Jews, right? Not only is it instituted by God, but they actually looked forward to participating in the many activities that took place during that time. And so many from around the country would pilgrimage. They would, they would go from all parts of Israel, sometimes even outside of Israel, to come and gather together in this, this area in Jerusalem would swell up to about three times of its normal size. And so it becomes this opportune moment for Jesus to make a presence and present the witness of Jesus Christ. But there's one problem. 
Chapter 7 opens with an announcement that there is a warrant out for Jesus' arrest. In verse 1, we're told that Jesus would not go into Judea because the Jewish leaders were seeking to what? To kill him. And this was no secret, by the way, right? You got, you got leaders that sometimes are conspiring secretly, but this is no secret because in verse 25, we, we're told from the general public, not just the leaders, is not this the man whom they seek to kill? There's no question. Jesus' head is up for grabs. The temple officers were dispatched by the Jewish leaders to find Jesus and place him under arrest so that they can bring him to trial with the end goal of putting him to death. And we know that they will succeed eventually, but not on their timeline. It'll be on God's timeline. We're only in chapter 7, right? There are many more chapters to go before we see Jesus crucified. It's going to be according to God's divine purpose, not according to men. Proverbs 19.21 says, Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. And Peter in Acts chapter 2, verse 23, clarified this for us in saying that the cruce of, of Jesus was by the hands of men, but it was according to, it says, the definite plan of God. So God is in full control. Jesus now in Galilee, so he went up to Galilee in order to avoid this sort of situation, and now he's contemplating coming back and facing the same reality. He can stay in Galilee where it's relatively safe, and I'm sure he would do really well to evangelize in Galilee because wherever Jesus is, a witness of God is being presented. Or he can go to where the crowd is. He can go and witness the truth and risk his arrest. Now, I just want to pause here for a moment. Have you ever been in this situation in your life where you're sort of at a fork in the road and you say, what am I to do? Where does God want me? We just want him to audibly speak to us and say, Ozan, this is what I want you to do. Crystal clear, close the book, let's go. But many times that's not the case. And I am convinced that Jesus, as in every account, he lifted this up in prayer to the Lord and he followed the instinct of the Holy Spirit. Listen to me closely. The same Holy Spirit that lives in every single one of you who have come to faith in Jesus Christ. And so he makes a decision by the work of the Spirit to risk his life. Jesus' wisdom is unmatched. His timing is perfect. He cannot be thwarted. He is in full control. He is very intentional about his timing, and he is very intentional about his message. In fact, if you're following along in your bulletins, this is what we're going to talk about. There is a central piece of this passage that I am just excited to bring to you. But in order to experience that excitement, you have to understand what's going on. And so I split this into three categories. There is an intentionality with Jesus. There's something very specific about the significance of this event that's about to take place. And if we don't understand that, then we won't understand the significance of the invitation of Jesus Christ, which follows. And that invitation then leads to an impact, which every one of us are obligated to experience. And so let's get into it. First, look with me at the intentionality of Jesus. About halfway through this week-long feast, Jesus arrives unexpectedly, according to the crowds, and he begins teaching. In verse 14, this is recorded. And people are amazed at his teaching. So instantly, Jesus gains this reputation. By the way, this just blows my mind. Jesus is going to the temple that's all about him. Remember in chapter 2, it says, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. Jesus is coming to fulfill the very thing that's happening, okay? This God-man, Jesus, is going to the very place that represents him. You don't get to say that, but Jesus gets to say that. He arrives in the middle of this Jewish feast, not just any feast, but the Feast of Tabernacles, as we're told. For seven days, people would assemble and then they would create these makeshift shelters and the, with brushes and claws and things like that. And it served as a reminder of the 40 years that the Jews spent in the wilderness. Remember that? After they were delivered out of the bondage of slavery in Egypt of about 400 years, they're now in the wilderness. And this is looking back at that experience. How God fed them and kept them and brought them to the promised land. And so there was a lot of eating there was a lot of drinking and dancing to commemorate God. In their eating, they remembered how God brought manna from heaven. Remember that message that PJ preached a little while ago? And in their drinking, they remembered how God provided water in the middle of a desert of all places. 
And so this feast was instituted by God as a celebration and a reminder of God's provision for them. And so what would happen is every day during this week-long ceremony, the the priest would grab this golden cistern, this, this pitcher, and he would walk it over to the pool of Siloam. And he would fill it up and he would bring it back to the altar. And there he would lift up this pitcher and he would pour it out. And I'm told they would say lift it higher and higher and higher. And then he would pour that water along the altar as he recited Isaiah chapter 12 verse 3. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And I'm told this is such a joyous occasion. I'm told Jews that don't experience this will never experience the sort of joy that comes with that feast. To take that pitcher and to yell out, lift it higher and higher and higher, and then to pour the water over the altar and to hear those words from Isaiah. And there's a twofold purpose for this kind of institution of pouring the water. First, it had a historical relevance as it pointed back to how Jesus provided for them in the wilderness, this physical thirst. Now, in Israel, water is not as readily available as it is to us. It's not as pure. And so water was a little bit of a scarcity. It's something that we all need, but it's like, you know, your life kind of depends on it. So you want to make sure you're situated near pure and clean water. And think about this, right? Physical thirst is probably one of the most powerful driving factors in the human will. Almost all other drives can probably be overcome by some degree or another, right? Maybe it's just withholding food. Maybe it's just saying, I'm going to just eliminate that altogether as a drive in my life altogether. But when it comes to thirst, and I mean real thirst, it's an entirely different category altogether. Most of us have never even experienced this kind of thirst. Maybe there are some who are in the military who have gone days without thirst, and you would know what I'm talking about. The need to satisfy the thirst becomes this dominating thing in your life. I just watched a a video with my wife just yesterday of this woman who was desperate for water. She broke into a person's home just desperate for water. They kicked her out, and then they gave her water. But there's this desperation that takes place. And so I'm not talking about just this mild thirst, you know, to just wet your mouth. I'm talking about this burning, consuming passion for water. If a man has never been serious about anything in his life and he is thirsty, he will be serious about getting water. It is this kind of thirst, listen to me closely, this kind of consuming thirst that engulfed the Israelites in the wilderness when they cried out to Moses in desperation. It's recorded in Exodus chapter 17. It says, people quarreled with Moses saying, give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? And they grumbled to Moses that it might be better if they went back to Egypt. They would rather go back into the bondage of slavery where there was water than to be in the wilderness thirsty. They recall those times when even in their incarceration, at least they had water. Moses even went so far to say that the people were close to stoning him. So Moses did what I think is very appropriate. He went to God for help and he was given instruction to smite a rock. And so Moses did, and I believe he did this with fierce anger. I think he came out and he struck that rock. And water came flowing out in all directions, and the thirst of God's people was satisfied that day. And as the priest would pour that water out of the cistern, the people would be reminded of God's provision over their physical bodies. And so there is this illustration of historical significance that was taking place during that feast. And not only a historical significance, but it also served as a prophetic and spiritual reminder. Each day of the festival, as that water was drawn up and poured out, God's people would be reminded that a day would eventually come when God would satisfy not just mere physical thirst, but he would satisfy soul-quenching thirst. It's recorded in pages of Isaiah 55, come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Ezekiel 47, speaking of the temple, it says everything will live where the water goes. There's this picture of water coming out of the temple, just flowing in all directions. And it says everything will live where the water goes. And so it is with this intentionality that Jesus comes to the temple. He knows that everyone, everyone, everyone thirsts spiritually. And Psalm 42 verse 1 says, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so my soul for you, O God. 
My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? It's not the mild interest of water that Jesus is talking about. It's our desperate need for thirst-quenching soul satisfaction. We come with this consuming longing for God that's been vacated. Soul satisfaction is not possible for anyone unless that consuming passion is redirected towards nothing less than God. Are your thoughts consumed by God? I wonder if there aren't some of those in here this morning who thirst for God. It is with this intentionality of Christ. He perfectly engineered the circumstance. He risks the rest and he coincides with this crucial feast to offer a most wonderful invitation for soul thirst satisfaction. Now let's look at the invitation of Christ. It is in this context that Christ invites the congregation. Look with me at verse 37. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up. Seven days of gathering the water from the pool of Siloam, seven days of remembrance of God's provision of water that was poured out on the altar, seven days of joyful celebration of future prophecy as it was poured out, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And on that last day of the ceremony, the great day, as John puts it, there is this dramatic moment when Jesus stands up and cries out in the silence. And this is no small cry. He cried out, it says. He cried out like a parent who lost their child. He says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. This is the cry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, what a glorious invitation from our Lord Jesus. Do you hear the words of your Savior cry out? If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Is there anyone out there? Anyone, hear the voice of Jesus say, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. What is Jesus saying in these words? He's saying, I am the rock that was struck in the wilderness. And how do I know that? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 says, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Jesus is the messianic rock that gave water in the wilderness. And more than that, he offers spiritual living water that can satisfy the soul. Those 40 years in the wilderness with that water wasn't enough to sustain them. But what Jesus offers is eternal life. Jesus says, I am the source of the water of life. I am the rock that was punished before the water flowed out. I am the source of soul satisfaction. I am the Messiah. I am the giver of the Spirit. I am the ultimate temple of God from which all those streams of living water flow out. He says, I am the substance of the ceremony of life-giving water that satisfies nothing less than the soul. He says, come and drink. God warrants you to drink, so drink. Drink. He says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. You see how this invitation is both broad and personal at the same time? He says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. It begs the question, doesn't it? Who are the thirsty Jesus has in mind here? Well, the answer to that question, I think, has already been provided to us in John chapter 4. I want to turn there just very briefly, just very briefly. <laughs> John chapter 4, the woman in Samaria, and the context is behind me as well on the screen, and I'm just going to read two verses to you, okay, just, just quickly. This woman shows up, not anticipating anything, but her regular function to go and get some water, and Jesus had to travel through Samaria, it says, I don't think he had to travel for the shortest route. I don't think he had to travel to avoid the Jews. I think he had to travel to meet this woman on a very personal note. And more than that, he shows up early. The creator of the universe 
who has three years of ministry, very time limited, mind you, shows up early for the sake of meeting this woman very intimately at the well. This woman who's hated by the Jews but loved by Jesus. Did I say that he invites any and all into his kingdom? Verse 10. Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Verse 14, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will, be, will, will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. This is Jesus making a promise to this woman that he offers living water. That water in the well is not sufficient to satisfy soul thirst, but Jesus offers what no well can offer. Who is it that thirsts? Everyone and anyone. And though we all drink from the wrong well, Jesus offers us a better water. He says, whoever drinks of this water will be thirsty again. Jesus has penned it in his own words. Every well that men turn to seeking to gratify the emptiness left by a vacated God will never find soul satisfaction. At the root of unfulfillment, hopelessness, discontentment, and dissatisfaction is a soul which continues to operate in restlessness because of the pains left by a vacated God. And Jesus says, drink of this well and you will be thirsty again. What well were you drawing from, as it were, when you encountered Jesus? In the case of this woman, she attempted to satisfy soul thirst from the well of immorality and sensual pleasure, didn't she? We know this because Jesus said, well, you have five husbands, and the one you have is not your legitimate husband. She tried that well, and her thirst was unquenched and dissatisfied, and there are many in our day longing to find that well. Many scheme with evil plans to drink of the well of sensual pleasure. Some cannot wait to forfeit their souls to participate in that well. And in our own generation, there are people that are unapologetically advertising that this is the well by which you will find soul satisfaction. Jesus stands at that well and he says, all who draw from it, whoever drinks of this well will be thirsty again. What other wells? There's a well of education that says, I just need to be intellectual enough. There's a well of entertainment and sports that says, as long as I can occupy my time with all the entertainment things around us, with all the aesthetics and all that, that's the well that I can draw from. And then there's the well, I think one of the most deceptive wells out there is the well of religion that says, if I just do this and do that, then I'll receive, right? Do, do, do. That's do, do, in my opinion. <laughs> Pick any other well, any other well. The inevitable outcome is more soul thirst. You see, people want only what God can offer. They just don't want God. Jesus stands over everyone. He says, whoever drinks of this water will be thirsty again. So why test the Lord in these things when he has already proven his words to be true? Where do I get this water Back to John chapter 7. Look again with me at verse 37. He says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to who? To me. Clear as day. You cannot pervert this passage. It is so clear. Anybody who thirsts, go to Jesus. Water that satisfies the soul has at its exclusive source the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Anything that God gives them of himself by way of soul satisfaction, he gives exclusively through Jesus Christ as revealed through the scriptures. Not through rituals, not through various organizations, not through virtue signaling, not through churches, not through man-made doctrines, not through emotions. He gives it through the living, glorified, exalted, holy, and gracious Christ. Brothers and sisters, listen to me very closely now, very closely if you do not have firsthand dealings with Jesus himself, you will never experience soul thirst satisfaction. You can be so close to him. You can be among people who have experienced that soul thirst satisfaction and yet be so far 
There is no saving virtue apart from the direct living contact with the Lord Jesus Christ. What a marvelous and intentional word from the Lord Jesus Christ. And he invites you today. And what can we expect to receive when we drink this water? This brings me finally to the impact of Jesus Christ. Jesus says, listen to this, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. I might have expected him to say, if he thirsts, let him come to me and drink, and then he'll be satisfied, right? And that would be sufficient enough, like the woman at the well. But there's more to it. This invitation, it's now extended in and through you. There's this overflowing of plurality of rivers that are in view. And he's essentially saying, if you are thirsty, come, take part now in satisfying other people. That's amazing in my mind that I get to be a part of that very soul thirst satisfaction. He's essentially saying, if you are thirsty, come and others will be satisfied as well. How do I know when someone's soul thirst is satisfied? I see their impact on other people. We've all seen a pond that holds water without flow, haven't we? Over time, what happens is it just becomes this germ-induced, nasty, filthy, stagnant water that nobody wants to drink out of. Now contrast that to a river of constant flowing water. It's fresh, it's sparkling, it's clean, it's abundant, and it brings life to its surrounding, doesn't it? We are blessed, Paul says, with every spiritual blessing from heaven above. And we are asked to be like those overflowing waters. I hope you see that you can't overflow unless you yourself are full. But if the riverbanks are full, then it generates more life. Jesus tells us the only way to save your life is to lose it. And the only way to keep it is to lose it. And to those who lose their life, they submit themselves to Jesus Christ in service to others. So what impact are you having on other people? Would you describe yourself as one who is overflowing? And perhaps this is why some of us are not experiencing the sort of blessing that Jesus wants us to experience. We are only half full ourselves, and we haven't been drinking from the source of abundant life, Jesus himself. Some of us have not been seeking Jesus out in faith, and we should be, and there's just simply not enough water to overflow and touch the lives of other people. You're too dried up. Sometimes we get too wrapped up in ourselves. We don't think enough about others, and we need to come for a drink from the source which satisfies the soul. And it doesn't end there. Look at, look at how it just gets infinitely better. I'm just going to end on this eternal note. You have an infinite helper, God himself, John provides insight into what Jesus meant about the rivers of living water. He says in verse 39, Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. There came a time in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit came and the church was born, and now we have the permanent indwelling Spirit of Christ. And he's speaking of that helper. What an amazing assertion of our reliance on the Holy Spirit, isn't it? The third person of the Trinity, without him, we are dried up, and there's no overflowing, there's no rivers. It's not about how much we hold, it's about how much we can give out, and who is it that enables us to give this kind of living water? No one less than God, the Holy Spirit, together the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are sent out in a powerful and complete way to apply the work of the Son. In fact, I don't have time to dissect this, but if I were to summarize the work of the Holy Spirit in one sentence, it would be this. He takes the work of the Son, and He brings it to fruition in you. He takes the work of the Son, and He brings it to fruition in you. With that, as a message, the invitation of Jesus Christ, will you please bow your heads in prayer with me? And as you have your heads bowed in prayer, imagine with me a desert. Imagine a place where there is very little rain. It's dry and barren and lifeless. And in that desert, there's a spring of water. Water that is there all year round bubbling up. You will never see such a spring in a desert by itself. It will always be surrounded by something. Green grass, trees, flowers, crops, fruitfulness in the desert. The spring overflows and it soaks into the surrounding soil. It goes beyond itself and brings fruitfulness to the dry land around it. 
When you see the palm trees and the bushes and the grass, you say, there is a spring that makes the ground fertile and fruitful. That could be the picture of your life or mine, a life that brings blessing to the people around it. Those who know you are changed by knowing you. They are helped. New life comes out of them because of your influence. You bring healing or fertility growth, joy in the workplace and in your community, and the world is a better place because of Christ in you, the one from whom all blessings flow. Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 3 to 4 says, For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They shall spring up among the grass like willows by flowing streams. And again in Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 to 26, we end with this. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face to you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen.